Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Pollen and Pillsbury United Communities Reimagine Public Safety event. My name is Melanie Walby, and I'm Pollen's design director. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, for those of you who are new to Pollen, we are a media arts organization that uses narrative storytelling to foster empathy, encourage connection across difference, and inspire meaningful action to change our collective story for the better. At Pollen, stories are our secret power. Stories nurture our human potential for deep empathy. Stories pave new paths and new opportunities for communities to connect across lines of difference. And stories inspire us to fight for each other when our flawed and beautiful humanity is threatened. So Minneapolis is asking itself big questions about the future of public safety. It's clear that the current system of policing doesn't serve our communities in equitable, constructive or healing ways. What's less clear is where we go from here. The answers will come not from a singular source, but through examining the layered histories, needs and experiences that shape community expectations of public safety. That's why we are here today to explore different perspectives on policing, public safety, city budgets, and what we can do at the community level to turn imagination into action. Pollen is based in Minneapolis, the homeland of the Dakota people, 11 sovereign Anishinaabe and Dakota nations that share geography with Minnesota. Today's land acknowledgement does not come without a request for action. We cannot have a conversation around public safety without acknowledging the lived experiences our indigenous neighbors have had with police brutality. It is on this indigenous land that we hold today's conversation from a place that cares deeply about everyone who lives in the city, especially the people who were here first. Last summer, Pollen and Pillsbury United communities teamed up to create the Reimagine Public Safety Story and Video Series. You can find all the stories we published together on our website, and I believe it will be put into the chat and put into the Twitter. Part of that story series was with Pillsbury and Adair Mosley, the president and CEO of Pillsbury United Communities is here with us this morning and has a few words he'd like to share. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you, thank you, uh, Melanie. I greatly appreciate that. And we are deeply honored to be uh, partnered with Pollen on this very um, transformative and impactful work um, as we all try to reimagine a community where we all feel safe and valued. Um, Pillsbury United Communities, a 140 year old community in, impact organization, um, co-creating enduring change toward a just society. And it's undergirded by a vision that every person has personal, social and economic power. Um, I serve as the president and CEO of Pillsbury United Communities. I'm also a 20 plus year resident of the North Minneapolis community. Our organization has partnered with Pollen on the Reimagined Public Safety docu-series. And this conversation um, is so important because we know our current system of public safety in Minneapolis, and more frankly, across this nation is not working. Use of force by police is used disproportionately against Black, Latino, our indigenous and Asian communities. The brutality and abuse in the criminal justice system is egregious. We're also seeing a spike in violent crime in our communities. Much of that crime is going unresolved, un unsolved. The pandemic has exacerbated health, wealth, educational disparities. People are suffering. They're fearful. They want change. We need to fund and implement safety solutions beyond policing. And we need to drastically and rapidly change the system of policing we have operating on the ground right now. Pillsbury United is committed to working with all stakeholders, community residents, public safety officials, and other government agencies and local leaders to create a just and ro robust system. 
What is clear is no matter where we go from here, we are going to need each other. We know that work will require bridge building between constituencies who have ideological far apart, right, who are far apart right now. We see the division amongst those we work with and serve. We need to go beyond the rhetoric of reform, both and abolish and defund and get very specific about our dreams. We believe it is important to support all conversations like this one about what the future could and should look like. Our primary role as an agency right now is equipping folks with the information they need to vote and support the initiatives, policies, amendments, ordinances, and bills that they believe in. That's why we're here today. We thank you for being here today with us. Thank you to Pollen for creating this expansive container for us to imagine into. Thank you so much. Um, just some final housekeeping notes. Um, please help share today's wisdom with your social networks uh, with the hashtag reimagine public safety MN. If you love to multitask, um, you can tweet and you can join us in the chat to say hello or to share your thoughts and questions. Today's event wouldn't be possible without the support of our sponsors, who we truly see as partners. So please help us thank them and give them shout outs on social media. Thank you to our presenting sponsors, the Bush Foundation and the Minneapolis Foundation, our supporting sponsor, Software for Good, and our community sponsors, Hiring Revolution, a new book by Alfonso Winker and Trina Olson of Team Dynamics, Clockward, and I Bailey. There they are. Um, <laughs> now let's get into it. Um, last week, Pollen published a story with Minneapolis artist and organizer Ricardo Levens Morales. We've invited Ricardo to read an excerpt from his story for all of us this morning. But before we do a brief introduction, Ricardo has been active in movements for racial, environmental, and economic justice since his family moved from Puerto Rico to Chicago in the late 1960s. His first political home was the Chicago Black Panther Defense Committee and his most recent MPD 150. Ricardo was a founding member of Northland Poster Collective between 1979 to 2009 and continues to use art, writing, and teaching as political medicines to promote healing and resistance in the face of oppression. He works out of a storefront studio with a team of radical troublemakers, all members of Newspaper and Communications Guild, CWA. And you can also learn more about Ricardo's story in Leslie Barlow's Within, Between, and Beyond art exhibit that will be up at MIA until October. Please join me in welcoming Ricardo Levens Morales. Is that my cue? <laughs> All right. So the piece begins with my arrival from Puerto Rico to the States in 1967. In Chicago, cops were everywhere. There's an early memory from then. Here's an early memory from then. I'm walking along the street one day, and there's this black kid around my age walking up the block ahead of me. I hear the purr of a squad car behind me crawling along. The cop rolls up on the kid and blasts out the loudspeaker. You'd look good behind bars. Then he guns his engine and peels away. Even with my light skin, I'd get harassed. Not on my darker friends, of course, but the sight of young folks of different colors hanging out together, it was like a personal insult to the cops. Why were you guys rattling the grate on that liquor store? What are you talking about, man? We didn't go anywhere near there. If I said you did, explains the cop, and he says you did, indicating his partner, then you did. You get used to it. I learned pretty quickly to keep to the back streets and alleys where I might run into a squad of Blackstone Rangers or occasionally some disciples and avoid the lit up streets and boulevards with the CPD patrolled. The gangs might take your money, but they aren't gonna humiliate you. They know that they'll still have to share the streets with you tomorrow, so why make an enemy? The police on the other hand can do whatever they feel like and they don't care. They made the rules. 
I didn't know it then, but during my teen years in Chicago, the mighty Blackstone Rangers were careful not to kill any white people, except in a botched robbery once. It was understood that the cops would look the other way as long as the victims were black, but taking a white life, that was forbidden. You know that black on black crime they're always talking about? There are police fingerprints all over it. Supporters of the police system are right on one key point. A system that sends billionaires on joy rides in space while hungry children sleep in the street really does need a violent paramilitary force to keep order. You can't solve the problem of policing while ignoring the massive inequality it's there to protect. You can't solve crime on the streets by shoring up the street to prison pipeline that just perpetuates poverty and trauma. Private equity firms snapping up single family homes on the north side are a real threat to community safety, not protesters demanding an end to police abuse. It will take a radical investment in the stability and well being of young people, their families, and neighborhoods, along with accountable community based intervention and support systems. That's how we change the message from you'd look good behind bars to you'd look good behind a telescope. That's how we stop the pendulum. Oh, thank you so much, everybody. Please join me in applause to your snaps. <laughs> um, oh no, I lost my spot because I got so into it. Um, <laughs> we have one question for you, Ricardo, and I have it memorized, so we're in good luck. Um, what is the role of an artist in movements? Telling the truth. It's really about truth telling and are the, are what art gives us are the skills to be able to tell it in a way that can be absorbable. Every nutrient needs to be delivered to the part of the body that needs it, right? And every truth needs to be delivered in a way that can make a difference. So that when we have, and when we look at the larger um, environment we're in, which is so saturated with lies, it's hard sometimes to distinguish them. So making those distinctions is really what it's about. And just one quick example, in the recent trial of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd, the entire police establishment paraded into the witness stand to explain to us that police are really trustworthy, anti-racist, professional, and cuddly. And Derek Chauvin was this terrible exception, right? So we will convict Derek Chauvin and throw him under the bus, and the price is that you accept the deep lie that these people are our friends and they're supporting us. So our role as an artist is not just to go for the quick win, but to look underneath and dig up the deep truth that can serve us well in the long run. All right, more applause, everybody. Just <laughs> Minneapolis is so lucky to have you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we really appreciate you. This morning, we're so excited to be in conversation um, with this panel. So I'm going to pass it off and introduce you to today's moderator, who is Ruby, our Pollen Studio Manager. Ruby is back stateside after a long, um, long, long time in Barbados. And while we miss her real life treehouse and beach Zoom backgrounds, we're glad to have her in MSP. Ruby believes telling stories is an act of love and resistance, and she is the proud organizer of several literary circles in the Twin Cities. How about a warm welcome and round of virtual applause for this morning's speakers. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Melanie, and good morning, everyone. I am so honored to be facilitating this important and timely discussion today and to be revisiting and sharing the Reimagined Public Safety series with you all once again. I was part of the team that worked on this story series last year with D.A. Bullock, who was one of our main collaborators and um, one of our panelists today. Uh, so I'm really excited to be able to revisit the work that we did um, in the context of this discussion. 
As Melanie had shared earlier, this story and video series created in partnership with Pillsbury United Communities invites us to question our current systems of policing and public safety and to imagine a better path forward. So our discussion today will invite us to do much of the same thing. And we have an incredible uh, set of people here to engage in that discussion with us. I'm gonna share some introductions before we get started. Uh, the first introduction I will make is for Rodolfo Gutierrez. He is the executive director of ASER, where he has been serving since May 2007 with extensive professional experience in quantitative and qualitative research and evaluation. He has spoken in several forums and is greatly committed to working with those interested in drawing a state of Minnesota where disparities are eliminated and are not based on ethnic or cultural differences anymore. Originally from Mexico, Rodolfo carries previous experience in research in Mexico and the US, which has been extremely useful while working with different and diverse communities, not only Latino. His formal education includes history and demography with extensive experience in research on demographic change. He offers a strong background in quantitative and qualitative research with an emphasis on immigration, education, healthcare, access, and cultural incorporation of diverse communities. My next introduction is for D.A. Bullock, who is an award-winning cinematographer, writer, and director for over 15 years. As a film and television director, an ad agency creative, cinematographer, and an editor, Bullock has been honed, has honed every facet of his filmmaking repertoire. In 2011, Bullock founded Bully Creative Shop in Minneapolis. Bully Creative Shop believes in story. Story is the spark. Story plants the seeds of innovative thinking. Story shakes up the status quo. In 2014, Bullock was named a McKnight Foundation slash IFP Minnesota Media Arts Fellow. Next, I'm going to introduce Erica Thorne, who has been a progressive activist, writer, facilitator, and cultural worker since 1974. She focuses on cross-race coalition building and anti-racism anti work with other whites. She has been a core trainer with Training for Change for 25 years. Erica has worked with environmental justice groups, undocumented immigrants, Hmong organizations, domestic violence activists, housing project residents, the National Department, the National Education Department of a large US union, and a full range of nonprofits, organizers, and rabble rousers. In 2012, she collaborated with local training organizations to co facilitate four workshops for 98 Burmese nonviolent activists in Northern Thailand. She trained multiracial groups of trainers in the UK through campaign boot camp and in Northern Europe. Erica is on the core organizing team of Surge Twin Cities, a white co-conspirator group. She loves to facilitate training of trainers, conflict waging, ethical grassroots fundraising and meetings, especially real sticky ones. Erica was the managing director of Minnesota Friends for a Nonviolent World for nearly three years and coordinated the Alternatives to Violence Project Minnesota, offering intensive workshops in prisons and jails for five years. As a former dancer for social change, she brings joyful physicality to her facilitation. This summer, she was in a musical play, Queen Bee, Outside in the Parks. My last introduction is for MJ. MJ is an organizer for Yes for Minneapolis, the Coalition of Asian American Leaders, and Filipinos for Immigrant Rights and Racial Justice Minnesota. At Yes for Minneapolis, she does field work to help pass the creation of a Department of Public Safety with a public health approach in place of the current police only system. At Cal, she facilitates conversations, leads activities, and helps build community and governmental relationships to combat anti-Asian racism and reimagine public safety. 
At FIRM, her focus is providing intergenerational and multicultural history and political education. Across all her work, MJ seeks to honor her Filipino heritage of resistance, address misunderstandings about Black and Indigenous-led movements, combat internalized racism rooted in imperialism, and foster an understanding toward the interconnected struggles of underrepresented peoples. Now that we know who we're talking to and with and amongst, let's get into our discussion for today. The first question I have for our panelists is, what have we been taught or conditioned to believe about policing and public safety? How can we shed or dismantle these harmful narratives to create space for new ones? I would love to invite Rodolfo to please share your response first and we'll after that hear from everybody. So Rodolfo, please share your thoughts. Oh, thank you everyone. Uh, real pleasure to be here with you all. And um, really thanks to Paul and to inviting, for inviting me to be here. And um, this question is something I always think about uh, since I was teaching at the University of Minnesota when, um, uh, student who was a freshman uh, approached to me and said that uh, she was surprised that she was seeing so much diversity in the classroom, coming from a small town in Minnesota, uh, growing up there till high school and never seeing any different people from whites. So she was astonished and then she came by the end of the, uh, of the semester almost crying, saying that I was talking about something ugly from the history of the United States. Well, I was talking about the Seneca Convention, civil rights movements, uh, the, all the fights for uh, human rights and everything and immigration and all the laws against immigrants. So uh, that said, it's like uh, we've been growing in a society and uh, it's not only this, but uh, this society where we are teaching history in a way that we are feeling very comfortable in the way we are growing up. And uh, we don't question too much about what is really happening around us if we don't see it. Until we see it, until we live it, is when we are aware about it. And that is something that uh, needs to, to change. We are being uh, taught that uh, things are okay until we see they are not okay. When we saw that, when we realized that things are not okay, we are not ready for that. We are unprepared and we react differently. Uh, we are always thinking, about what if things were not that way, but we don't have any solution to that. We don't have any answer to that. And um, that said, uh, I guess we need to start changing that vision, start changing the way we teach our children, our young kids, our youth, uh, how to understand our process and see how even the police existence is justified by a horrific kind of uh, episode in the history of the United States where it is for the slave owners to be protected and the ownership to be preserved that the police is created. And now is the same kind of uh, conception here to protect the, the ones who are uh, well positioned initially. So we need to change the narrative. We need to change the way we teach. And uh, that is going to bring new understanding and also uh, the possibility of creating new answers to that. It's what I was always thinking. And uh, I say, uh, again, uh, while you are teaching at a university or uh, at, in high school, you need to assume your responsibility of talking about this openly and say it uh, out loud. Uh, we need to change the system because it is not working properly. Thank you. Thank you for that response, Rodolfo. MJ, can I ask you to share your thoughts next? Again, the question is, what have we been taught or conditioned to believe about policing and public safety? How can we shed or dismantle these harmful narratives to create space for new ones? MJ, I'd love to hear from you. Sure. Um, so as probably all of not, most if not all of us already have been exposed to, um, the history of, of policing in the United States, that it begins in slave catching. So given all of that, um, my personal experience is um, I learned to speak English by watching a lot of cartoons. So even in something as um, 
you know, even something designed for children and something so seemingly simplistic, there are always caricatures of police, whether they're just uh, eating donuts uh, in, in cartoons and, and comic books. I read a lot of those. Um, and then if you, you know, look to movies as well, and um, I don't know if you have heard or read about America is in the Hearts. It's, it's by um, Carlos Bulosan. He was an immigrant from the 1930s. And there he, um, he writes about witnessing police officers shooting Filipinos and his um, compatriot, uh, his uh, neighbors just telling him, oh, that just happens. Police officers just shoot Pinoy's like that. Um, and then until now, um, currently there is the so-called war on drugs uh, back home in the Philippines. And it is about you know, the government um, using police force to address um, poverty really and um, spread of drug use without really addressing, without being preventive, but just being reactive. So what I'm trying to say is that from the most minute of things like comic books to addressing something really, really uh, you know, important like socioeconomic status and, and inequities, um, we're told that the answer is policing. So it's both subliminal, but also the government telling us these answers. And, and I talk about the Philippines, but obviously there is, we're in the United States of America and the parallel is, is very evident. Um, so that is how I would answer that question. That's just what we're constantly taught. Thank you for that response, um, MJ. And thank you for addressing all of the images and media that shape our understanding of public and of policing and public safety. DA, I want to ask you next as an image maker, as a media maker, what have we been taught and conditioned to believe about public safety and policing and how can we shed and dismantle these harmful narratives to create space for new ones? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I agree with everything Rodolfo and MJ just, just mentioned. I think, you know, um, if we really start to think about it and just take moments, you'd be astounded by how much we've been conditioned to believe that is contrary or contrast to our actual like common sense, right? Like we've been conditioned to believe that we need large force of, of really militarized people in order to keep us safe despite the fact that most of us, we gather together, we get together all the time and we don't have a police officer at the door, right? Making sure nobody's hitting somebody else over the head. We have a really strong, robust social contract about how we, we gather together, how we do socialize and how we, we build community. And that's been existing far uh, before we ever had the concept of police. So that's kind of a common sense thing that we, we often are conditioned to believe contrary to that. We're also conditioned to believe that the more money we spend on that, that militarization of that, that force, that, that um, violent force, um, the safer we're gonna be, despite, again, evidence to the contrary. Like I'm from Chicago originally, and I know um, the past year, Chicago, Chicago has 13,000 police officers. Like let that sink in. Chicago is a much bigger city than, than Minneapolis, but still, like, think about that. That's 13,000 police officers, yet they still have a critical, significant gun crime and, and gun violence problem within communities, right? That means we're addressing, and $1.6 billion spent on policing alone. That's more than our entire budget. Yet we're still pouring those resources into something that is not like turning out the results that, that we've been conditioned to assume um, that are there based on this sort of, if we invest more in policing and policing solely, then we're gonna get this result of safety. We've also been conditioned to believe that sort of our greatest fears instead of our logic should motivate all our, our public safety conversations, despite like data that's in front of you, like, odds are you're not going to be the victim of, of violent crime if you're not a certain person in this community, um, which is black and brown folks, young folks, folks who are, are living in poverty or um, 
less than ideal conditions. Um, and so we've been, we've been conditioned to believe that we're all susceptible to the same amount of harm and victimization. And that's, that's simply not true. Um, and we invest in, a, in public safety in that way, as if across the board, everybody is as least safe as, as, as everyone else. And so that's, that's a mistake sort of, and a mistake in sort of our assumptions and how we drive them into um, public policy. I would say lastly, the, the, the more pernicious assumption, which you know, saddens me like to my core is that we, we all have to examine the, the assumptions that are built in that um, proximity to black people and brown people uh, equals being less safe. And, and we have to be real about that because that's, that's written throughout the codes and ordinances and everything that, that um, have been established in this country and established in municipalities and in states, um, how much of coding and ordinance has been drawn up based on that principle and false belief alone that uh, white folks are less safe, the closer and the more uh, prevalent black and brown folks are in your in your communities and you know really that's a, that's an honest assessment we got to do with, with ourselves about we could be good people and still be buying into that um, that kind of conditioning because that conditioning starts at birth Thank you so much, DA, for your response and your thoughts to that question. Erica, I think DA has set um, the perfect stage for your perspective on this question. Um, and I'd love to know how, um, I'd love for you to share some of your thoughts on how fear has influenced certain communities' beliefs about policing and public safety, what um, certain communities have been taught and conditioned to believe about policing and public safety and how we can shed and dismantle these harmful narratives. Erica, please respond. Thank you, Ruby. And um, uh, the uh, tremendous wisdom and experience that's already been uh, shared, um, I can hardly build on. Um, the, the, the thing that I want to uh, be sure to share is that um, uh, uh, stemming from what you uh, said, DA, um, us white people are, are conditioned not just to like believe the falsehood that police keep us safe, but that just seeing if, if DA, DA and I were neighbors, DA seeing you coming out of your house would, if I haven't questioned my conditioning, would uh, give rise to like, oh my gosh, I'm unsafe. Whoa, what is that person doing here? And um, this is this is rooted in um, policing as uh, patrolling of enslaved people, particularly enslaved people who managed to escape, and the consequences. Going, going back to that, to the last 401 years, the consequences on the individual who did escape was horrific. As we see now, the people, uh, black and brown people, uh, poor people, uh, obviously queer and transgender people, once they're in the hands of the police, all bets are off for, for how someone will emerge as we've seen so publicly for so many years. So for, for white people, I think the individual challenge is to recognize, wow, I've been told lies from the womb and there have been horrific crimes against humanity and crimes against individuals that are done in my name every day and have been done in my name every century since, uh, probably since the Romans. Uh, so this stuff is deep and individually, we need to, to recognize that and do the, the tough work of deconditioning and, and reconditioning. And finally, I just wanna say that the, um, 
the solution is not for it, we, we know for sure that the solution is not for individual people to like work on our racism and do all that good and be an ally and demand ally cookies for being an ally. Um, that is not where the future lies. The future lies in us doing collectively as white people, sometimes just in all white spaces to come to grips with all this conditioning and the harm that we have done individually and as I say, have been done in our name. And then it's so clear what to do as we evolve there, which is to support in whatever realm we are working in. I happen to be a political activist and an abolitionist. Um, so I support the Yes for Minneapolis Coalition and, and do, do what I can. Um, and as does Surge, but to follow the lead of black people, brown people, poor people, people who actually know what is the way out of this horrifically violent status quo that has developed, follow that lead and step back in all our conditioning of like, oh, I'm white, I'm supposed to know the answer to this stuff. You know, we can deal with that conditioning with each other elsewhere, but we need to step up in support of the people who actually know how, what, what the vision is and how we can get there. Thank you for that response, Erica. And thank you to all of the panelists for your response to that question. You've all done a really great job of explaining the current conditions, the current narratives that shape our beliefs and understanding about policing and public safety. I want to shift our questioning to a little something a little bit more imaginative that references one of the stories from our series. In our first story of the series titled, Things Must Change, writer Michael Kleber Diggs shared this vision for Minneapolis. As the sun sets, everyone goes home. Everyone makes it home. Everyone has enough to live. Everyone feels safe, protected, and served by their government. I'd like to ask each of you on the panel to activate your imaginations and to help us paint a picture for what life looks like in this city, in this world, when everyone is safe here. MJ, can I ask you to share your thoughts first? Sure. Um, I can start with the visual. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of green space, a lot of community gardens. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of uh, like more of a gift economy types of exchanges. Um, and I really like this, this question too, because it's, um, I mean, it relates to, <laughs> it relates to like federal things as well. Um, a lot of the, a lot of how we measure um, safety and, and economic, socioeconomic success doesn't um, capture all the ways that immigrant communities, black and brown indigenous communities, how they actually measure safety and overall success. So I really like um, that question. And I guess I would see more of what I was actually, what I grew up in, which was more community care. Um, I was raised by a village. It took a village to raise me. And I don't really see that as much here unless you're in Black, Brown, Indigenous, and immigrant communities. So I would like to see more of that. Um, and inheritance looks different too. Um, and it's not just it's not just money and like physical property. You know, it's it's also about talking more about um, cultural practices and and things like that. Um, and yeah, and just other means of of resource, not just sharing but also pooling. And so beyond the things that the government are telling us in terms of, of aid, how to pull your, your I think the quote is the, the bootstraps, that, that one. Um, so like just moving away from that and, and making it more um, community-based. Um, and uh, a lot of the work that I do with FIRM is um, multicultural and, and intergenerational um, political education. And so talking more about 
the how um yeah about multi-generational households and and resource pooling and sharing um yeah Thank you for that response, MJ. I especially appreciated that visual um, that you started off with because I think having that vision and having that imagination is a really important part of the uh, building of a better future that we're discussing today. DA, can I ask you next, what does life in this city look like when everyone is safe here? <clears throat> well, yeah, I, you know, I think the sort of the obvious answer is is everybody's like the needs and desires are being taken care of and i say needs because that's part of it but it's, it's not about just merely surviving it's about the desires like what what creates hope in a person like that's not exclusive to white folks or black folks or, or any other um ethnicity or nationality or race it, it's it's sort of universal in that you can create hope in a person in a community by supplying aspirational components to folks life, right? Which is obviously taking care of basic needs, which means I have a safe and secure housing that is available to me. But I also have, you know, um, you know, uh, an economic structure and safety net under me that is makes me feel hopeful and makes me feel safe. But the other side of that component is I have a, a governmental structure that will defend that the way they've proven that they would defend property, right? Like they'll send out forces and, and militaries and, and you know National Guard in order to defend downtown property, but they haven't sent anybody out to defend us against Havenbrook Homes, which has been operating in North Minneapolis for the last, uh, since the, the, the crash, buying up homes, exploiting folks who are renter, renters and, and very much vulnerable. And that, that's, that's a form of violence that we've ne we're never re protected from. In fact, we have a, a, you know, a number of candidates who aren't even willing to sign on to, and, and current uh, elected officials who aren't even willing to sign on to renter protections because they don't see the, they don't understand how renter protections keeps us safe. Like that's that's just like that's the kind of basic understanding that I, I expect my 16 year old to have. So we should obviously expect uh, you know our elected officials to have that same kind of vision and understanding. So you know I, I could also I want to like allow folks who've been doing this and have been doing this concurrently to our sort of future vision. They've been creating our future vision right now. So there's and I'll put it in the chat. There's a um, website called millionexperiments.org. Uh, and and it's, it's a wonderful website and it actually includes some of our local uh, visionaries like uh, Rep and Powderhorn Safety. Um, but but they're, they're like showing us how we are currently designing the future that we wanna live, right? Like there are organizations and people in communities who are currently doing the things that around this this sort of grand design. Um, and I, I love the fact that the way we understand in community uh, safety, because that's kind of the broad um, understanding of this website is it's about mutual aid, right? It's about collective ownership, right? It's about not, not just how do we replace like the physical bodies of police, somebody's gonna come in and, and intervene when something is happening to you. But it's about like how you put a refrigerator on the corner that you have these public like we have these public libraries, we have a public refrigerator that's one of the ideas like a public refrigerator on the corner I was like damn that's that's brilliant like it's, it's not even that hard to do. But we just don't have any investment in those kind of ideas all our investment in the kind of ideas are like how do we there's there's one side was like how do we maintain the status quo and keep it in place and fight against these people who are trying to change it. And then, you know, the other side is we have to be reactionary in order to just fight for the, the bare minimum, right? Like, it's like the bare minimum is, you know, what are we gonna do with MPD? Are we gonna take a million dollars from them this year or $2 million from that, that next year? Um, so we're, we're caught up in this, this sort of 
small fight when really my, my belief, my expectation, my hope for, for our entire community, that means the entire city, not just the black community, which I hold near and dear, but is that, that we were all like embracing this opportunity to be visionary about safety, like embracing this opportunity to be like, yeah, what if, what if we did like think of things like, you know, like it, it, it seems like small and it seems like almost superfluous, but it's, it's actually very important. Like what if we dedicated as much into aesthetics and lighting on a corner that we, we said, oh, this, this corner has been problematic. Like in, in my neighborhood, it's Lowry and Logan. It's been problematic forever. There's a gas station there. People have been shot there. It's been just constant, constant, constant. And we constantly go into the police like, can you all solve this? Can you all solve this? And they're constantly telling us, no, we have no idea. We, we don't know anything to do. And we, we've dedicated all of this sort of um, energy into retrofitting something that is not working to us instead of like fitting something that actually works. Right? And that's the work, that's the imaginary sort of radical understanding that I want us all to come to. Um, sorry, I, I went on long, but, and I'll, I'll put that that link in the in the chat. Thank you, DA, for sharing your vision and some of the references that um, help inform that vision. Erica, what does life in the city look like to you when everyone is safe here? <clears throat> Good, thanks. And uh, I, I forgot to thank Pollen and everybody for getting us on here. So, so I'm, I'm thrilled and honored uh, to be here. Well, to me, it looks like uh, everything that uh, MJ and uh, DA said. Um, and uh, I'm seeing people who are building relationships in, in, uh, uh, in the process of rebuilding public safety um, so that uh, different kinds of relationships can happen um, uh, at times cross race. Um, uh, because we are getting a, a community refrigerator on our corner, you know, or because we are organizing to have the, uh, the, the city charter amended, um, or are we, or we are holding the sacred space at 38th and Chicago, the free state of George Floyd. So th those examples in the future and in the present, um, that is that is, uh, and the relationships that come of those are directly revolutionary because the because segregation is so prevalent in our society, and um, so I am not advocating that every well-meaning white person, of which I have been one too, um, every well-meaning uh, white person, come in and say, ah. I know what to do or start, you know, our control issues start showing up, you know, all kinds of disasters happen uh, as uh, unreflective white people come into movements. However, we have ways to uh, work with each other to, um, to become more skillful uh, at cross-race relationships because the majority of white people aren't uh, and are downright destructive and there is more, so I, uh, 1986, I think, was when I committed my life to fighting racism for the rest of my life as a white woman. And I have seen change in the level of, the sheer quantity of white people that are at least willing to ask some questions. Um, and I remember uh, when Susan Raffo and Heather Hackman um, uh, uh, gave a workshop trying to somatically get us white people to, to deal with the, the, in, the invasion of our bodies of white supremacy. And there were like 40 people in the room. And I burst out crying toward the end of it because I was like, I did not know if I'd ever be in a room of 40 white people who were willing to go this deep. So I think I've made clear that I don't think white people are the, are the, uh, are the folks who know what to do and our energies, our vision and our 
hard, hard and incredibly love-based uh, daily work to uh, say no to white supremacy and say yes to the future um, is, is important. I, frankly, I don't think it's crucial for the change and I think it will be useful. The more of us, you know, the more rooms of 40 people that are grappling with stuff and then are more equipped to go out and, and uh, support and be a productive part of movements, um, uh, uh, the better. We just need to be something we are so trained never to be, which is humble and realistic. Thank you, Erica. And before we move on to our next and likely last question, Rodolfo, I'll ask for your uh, final response towards the question, what does life in the city look like when everyone is safe here? Yeah, thank you. And uh, well, I, I, I might say I have to add very little to what I heard already, but I wanted to share some, some imagination I have. So. Uh, perhaps in an alternate world, it's already there, I don't know. I am very much into the comics right now, so uh, there might be an alternate world. In that alternate world, there is no need of police. The policing is uh, just uh, unnecessary because everybody is okay with everybody. There is not ambition, everybody has what they need, how they need it. What uh, DA was pointing out, uh, her way to live is uh, there in place. Uh, here in place in Minneapolis and St. Paul, everybody has what they need and why they they have to have to do it okay. And that that brings me a memory when uh, I was younger. I once was younger. I remember um, as uh, MJ was saying. I, I grew up in a very poor neighborhood. Um, it was almost a village, and they uh, work with us. And uh, I remember clearly when I was a kid just going to my neighbor's houses anytime I wanted. Everybody were, was there welcoming us and offering us food and candies and uh, uh, lollipops and whatever. They offer us to come and watch together as a community, uh, the movies, the uh, cartoons on TVs, anytime they were sharing everything the dogs they were living in those houses were living in the entire neighborhood and they were our dogs. And we were all, all kind of uh, that kind of community. And walking around there in those streets were the safest time I remember. I was feeling safe. I was feeling protected. I was feeling uh, like everything was perfect. We didn't need anyone to take care of anyone else because we were taking care of everybody there in that neighborhood. My mom was well known as Aunt Juanita, who everybody respected, as we respected Aunt uh, Ines or whomever ward was there in the other in the neighborhood houses. So uh, everybody was well known, and that was the I feel I insist the perfect sense of uh, safety. And I sense it again when uh, when I was here in Minnesota, but not when I arrived, but when I visited Brainerd and in our indigenous community, which I really love. They talked. I was a Lakota member, which really made me feel very good. Uh, and they said, you are very welcome, brother. No, nevertheless, you are not Lakota. You look like Lakota. You are very welcome here. Feel free to be part of our community. That time I was feeling also very safe. It's not the same when I, were, I am walking out there in the streets in uh, Minneapolis or in St. Paul, and I see the police approaching, I feel that something is wrong. And that is, doesn't make me feel uh, safe, even though the police is there, uh, that's the opposite for me. Like the police is here because there are problems. So I imagine that place like a uh, uh, brainer and where I was there uh, not that long ago and uh, in Mexico city in uh, that neighborhood I, I grew up in where everybody was welcoming everyone and uh, saying, you are my brother, you are my sister, we are all together. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Rodolfo. You know, I think it's so important to remember that some of the visions that we have for um, safety and another way forward are already existing as you've shared. So I really appreciate um, you sharing 
you sharing that. Um, we are just coming right on time, and I know that we're we will want to make space for Q and A. So maybe as uh, those questions are coming in, I will ask uh, the panel the very last question I have for you. Oops, I just muted myself on accident. The last question I have for you all is. Um, in reference to another one of the stories from our series, and that story is titled Here Again. In that story, uh, writer Nima Day Louise Dunbar asked us how hope persists when it feels like we see the same tragic story play out time and time again. So I would like to ask all of you, how does hope persist? Please show us the path and not just the solution. And DA, maybe I'll ask you to answer this one first. Yeah, I, I alluded to it earlier. You know, um, I think um, Marion Kaba said, you know, a lot of the work we do is, is a practice, right? Like, so hope is also a practice. Um, and you can't expect, you can't have the expectation uh, out of, especially young people who have developing minds for them to be hopeful and, and act accordingly unless you're building that practice within their life. Um, and so if we haven't served that up or we haven't serviced that <clears throat> and in a dedicated way, not a like superfluous sort of, yeah, now we're, we're thinking about, you know, just, just for example, like um, we just got federal dollars from, uh, for, for COVID relief. And sort of the, the last the sort of tiny line on the bottom of it was about youth, right? Yet all of our rhetoric is talking about like this youth gun violence problem that we can't get our arms around and we can't solve, seem to solve, although we have a collective genius to do all these other wild outlandish things. I read we were, we're creating terraforming oxygen on Mars right now. Um, we can do that. We can think about that and figure out a way to do that, but we can't wrap our minds around how to how to you know be hopeful around our youth in our communities, and and we we think our only solution is well we gotta like have this again this force to to sort of counteract of one violent force going up against another violent force. That's that's our current sort of solution and understanding, or, or you know, remove those young people from the community and lock them up expect for them to come back hopeful, reform, changed, beautiful people come out of a violent system that's, that's been harming them day in and day out. Um, and ha we have the expectation that they're gonna come out of that transformed and, and changed. And then we use the exceptional person who's able to do that as, as the standard, right? And we do that with communities. We use the exceptional black person to be the standard of, well, that person made it, and that person is creating their own barbershop um, in the community, and you know, that, that's the exception. And then we're gonna we're gonna say, you know, that's that's the rule, like that we're gonna create hope by it. And, and so I say all that to say it's easy, it's actually easy to create hope in people's lives if we're dedicated to it and we're honest about it, like what we are investing in and what we are putting our, our, um, our real energy and resources behind. And, and does that match up your, your values and your rhetoric? Does it match up with what we're actually doing? Um, and that what we're actually doing is, is very accessible in the sense that we elect the people to do it. We, we have opportunities, like we have this charter change opportunity to, to make changes along the way and, and to adapt and, and evolve. Um, but if we reject those opportunities and we, we, we sort of say, yeah, our expectation is, again, the current system is going to reform itself, even though nothing in evidence has shown us that that has ever happened in history. Nothing. Zero. Even in the last year, nothing is in evidence. I don't think anybody on this call could say, I can point to one substantive reform that's happened with the Minneapolis Police Department. Like I, I, I would ask that, not even like as a dare or trying to like put anybody on blast, but it's like, just, just as a collective question, we ask ourselves like, 
our expectations around these things that we know how to create. We know how to create community, suburban communities already create idealistic, idyllic conditions. They do it all the time. Um, we have a, the, I think, I forget the Denville or one of these small communities in Minnesota is, is the richest community in Minnesota. They don't have a police department. They rely on the sheriff's department. It's not because they're better people than us. That's not because they are just more evolved and, and they, they have built, based on their resources, they have built a dedication to a different kind of life, a hopeful life. They don't have to worry about their kids. Their kids are still susceptible to being quote unquote bad kids as my kids, but they don't have to worry about the ramifications of a hopeless child, of a, a child that can see no social mobility in his, in his future, his or her future. Um, you know, we, we know how to do these things. We, we, we don't even like have to guess at it. It's right there at our grasp, yet we continue to grasp back at things that have failed us in the past. And, and I, would, I would argue that that's all out of fear. It is entirely out of fear. And so just imagine if you conducted your life like that, where you made every important decision about your kids, about everything out of fear, abject fear, whether it's rational or not. Um, imagine what that life would be as just for living, like you wouldn't leave your house. Um, so so we, we can't make public policy out of fear. We, we create hope with a practice and we need to start utilizing and, and adhering to that practice on a regular basis, all of us. Thank you, DA. Thank you for that very important reminder. Um, about hope as a practice. I'm gonna ask for just one more response so that we make sure that we have time for this audience Q&A. And MJ, I'm gonna direct the question to you in sort of all of your organizing experience and expertise. Um, I'd like to ask you to respond to this question. How does hope persist? And if you could speak to uh, the path, not just the solution, we'd love to hear from you. Sure, um, my hope, both lies in um, what the, like the work that's currently being done, but also in the imagined uh, future. I my hope rests a lot, and I think hope and inspiration come go hand in hand. So I, I feel a lot of hope and uh, inspiration from the many legs um, that are moving simultaneously. Um, I find hope in, in being familiar with my ecosystem and that there are so many moving parts. Um, and we're all, you know, striving for the same things. Um, and when I when I'm talking about work that's currently being done, um, I'm using kind of my coalition um, experience as a lens for that. So, for example, when it comes to civic engagement and making people making sure that people are going out to vote, um, coalition members like you know AAOP um, are doing that leg of work. Um, more service oriented uh, orgs like. CAPI and Vietnamese social services, they're doing that leg of work. Um, people who are doing more policy work, uh, that's the Coalition of Asian American Leaders and other um, community organizations within um, my coalitions, they're all um, fighting for uh, you know, ethnic studies and they're all saying our stories matter, just you know, we deserve more than a page in the history books. I am really, really, uh, I find such great hope and inspiration to know that I work alongside these people. It's it's really um, inspirational. Um, and then, you know, for, I guess from my personal experience, I find hope and inspiration that at, at my most depressive state because of experiencing white supremacy, people made sure that to feed me, people made sure that I slept and that I ate and that I showered. And I find hope in the future that that one day, if not right now, you know, and continuously every day, that I'm able to pay it back, pay it forward. Um, so I find a lot of hope and inspiration from, from personal experience, but also from my um, 
coalition work. Oh, and there's also, um, I forgot to mention, there's also the art leg of this movement. Um, so people like Taiko Arts Midwest, Theater Mu, um, Uwashi, um, and yeah, just so many organizations that, you know, it would take me probably three hours to go through all of them, but be really familiar with your ecosystem, whether it's a community organizing ecosystem, um, and we can talk about the nonprofit industrial complex later. So like, so I find inspiration in the work that people are trying to do now, given limitations, but I also find hope in imagined futures, if that makes sense. So it, it and all of those have to be simultaneously be moving. Um, and they are, and we're, and we're heading there. And I'm, I'm, yeah, and there's so many inspirational people who are working to disaggregate data so that we're providing appropriate care um, so that we're not just being spoken about in, in monolithic terms. And I'm talking about all communities. Um, yeah, that's really, really inspirational to me and, and hopeful to me. Thank you so much, MJ, for your response. If I may add pollen to that list of the arts ecosystem, part of the arts ecosystem where um, hope can be found, I, I'd like to take that opportunity as we close out to actually um, call out again uh, the video and story series that this um, this entire virtual event is based off of the Reimagined Public Safety series. I'm sure one of my team members will put the link in the chat again. But as we uh, close out this panel, thank you to each of the panelists for sharing your thoughts and responses to um, this question for inviting us to activate imagination, to activate hope, and to imagine a better path forward. Um, there were uh, several, um, themes explored in the video and story series. So I do want to invite everybody to take some time to look through the stories. Through this series, we um, got to explore policing public safety and imagining a better path forward with different communities. Um, the story titled An Untitled Song is one of my personal favorites that um, spoke to youth in our community about the better path forward. We have a story about uh, this 1.6 billion Minneapolis city budget and how uh, the budget reflects our values as a community and um, what we see as safety as and what we see as a path forward. So uh, please uh, take some time to revisit both the art and story that is a part of the series in addition to um, Ricardo's piece that he read from earlier today. So with that, um, I'm gonna hand it back to Julie. Thank you, Ruby. And thank you, DA and Erica and MJ and Rodolfo and Ricardo and Melanie. And you, Ruby, for uh, this excellent, rich, um, complex conversation. I really appreciate everyone, everyone sharing. Um, I know that I saw a couple of questions in the chat, but there, there is one I want to um, voice here uh, before we move into our small group discussion, um, which comes from Sheila. And Sheila's question is, what do we do when those in power pit communities of color against one another in an attempt to uphold the status quo of policing. Um, and I think this, this question is really relevant to the conversation that we just had about different community perspectives on policing and that different communities of color should not be treated as monoliths, that there are different opinions about that path forward. So um, I'd like to pose that question uh, to the panel and um, see who would like to respond to that. Don't all answer at once. <laughs> I'll, I'll, take, I'll take a crack at it. Um, so I'll, I'll start off by saying, <clears throat> I want folks to know, like my only expectation of people, white people, black people, all people, um, is not for you to have any form of particular like feeling about what I'm saying or, or guilt or, you know, those kind of visceral responses. Um, my belief and expectation out of people is that you have rigor and thoughtfulness uh, about the things that we assume, the things like we started off talking about, the things we've been conditioned to believe. Um, 
that that's the only thing we owe to each other in in that sense and that because what happens is with our assumptions we end up upholding um things that are uh discriminatory unfair historically um based in in discrimination and and you know some of the laws that we think we've we've far out out distance but but are still in place you know like we still have redlining in this city because financial institutions still refuse to offer loans to qualify black and brown folks that's that, that's just a fact that's a data fact you can go look it up you don't have to believe me you don't have to have any kind of catch any kind of feelings about it you just have to be rigorous about understanding facts and once you know those facts because there's a certain set of facts about the Minneapolis Police Department or the current uh, public, system, uh, public safety system, then we, we have to operate with those facts in mind. And so when I, when I see people in power pitting people of color against one another, um, I think the first thing to do is recognize that that is in fact what is happening. Um, and we can point to a number of data points to show that that's what's happening. And then resist your conditioning, which is generally people are going to believe what they're sort of predisposed to believe. So if they have a black chief of police telling you that that's what reform and change looks like, then you would accept that on its surface and you won't be rigorous about like asking, well, what what reforms have you done in the last year? You won't ask, well, um, what officers have you fired in the last year? If we, want, if we want to leave it up to you and we want to trust in you because your, your symbolism of, of what, what you are, which not discounting, like I, I actually admire Chief Arredondo quite a bit for what he's achieved in his career, like understanding what a black man has to go through in order to achieve in a, in a career. I can have that respect for the man and his journey without, and, and not give up my rigor about asking him questions about the job he is tasked to do. And so in order for us to avoid this, this sort of cynical politics of pitting black folks against other black folks, or, or you know, um, all of these, these sort of fights that are in the cynical politics, we just have to be rigorous about the questions we're asking, the, the sort of tokenism that we're accepting, because it, it is tokenism. Like, and that, that is an insult to, to every hardworking uh, BIPOC person um, with integrity on this planet and that we don't need tokenism. We, we need actual results. We need actual conditions to change in our communities. We don't need exceptionalism. We don't need another symbol of, symbol of black excellence. We need actual substantive change in our community. Um, and I say that for myself, because I've, I've been put in those positions to represent black excellence or black, you know, whatever. Um, and so I have to make sure that I'm not being put in that position in order to be a proxy for the status quo to stay in, in, in the same place. Um, yeah, so that, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, DA. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to move us quickly now into um, small group discussions because we we do want to give everyone here an opportunity to reflect on on one of the questions that Ruby posed uh, to the panel as well. Um, so before we do that, um, my colleague Tom is going to work on getting everybody into breakouts here in just a second. Um, we do have hosts for each of our breakout rooms, so I want to thank uh, those wonderful Polonites for agreeing to help host these conversations. So they'll help get introductions going and um, share the discussion prompt with you. Um, just a couple of quick group agreements to keep in mind. Uh, take space, make space. In other words, be mindful of uh, how much you're sharing or not sharing and adjust accordingly. Um, share the lesson, not the story. Um, there's a lot that we can all learn from one another, but when we're sharing that publicly, um, make sure you're not sharing people's you know, names or organizations unless they've given you permission to do so. And just be game. 
you know, be open and vulnerable and um, willing to share. That's how we, we get through this imagination process. And now the, the question that we're gonna invite you all uh, to ponder during these group discussions uh, is this, uh, what would your life look like if you and everyone in our community felt safe and supported and protected? Um, so I think we're going to end up with about 10, 12 minutes um, for our discussion here. <laughs> um, and then I'll uh, bring this back just for a couple of last minute um, actions uh, that we're hoping everyone will take away from this morning's conversation. So Tom, I'll let you take it away to send us all into space. Okay, I'm going to be sending you all to a room and you'll get about a 30 second warning before the rooms will be closing. So enjoy your conversations. All right, welcome back everyone. We're gonna just wrap up here with a couple of um, last action items. Um, wanna again, thank everyone um, who participated in, in the panel conversation this morning, uh, Melanie and Adair and Ricardo, uh, DA, MJ, Rodolfo, Erica, Ruby. Um, huge thanks again to our sponsors at the Bush Foundation, Minneapolis Foundation Software for Good, Hiring Revolution, Clockwork, and Ide Bailey. Um, super, super duper important, y'all. There's an election coming up <laughs> um, for both Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, Minneapolis, we've got you know some questions on the ballot. We've got mayor's race, uh, all city council members, um, and public safety is on the ballot in uh, Minneapolis on in November. So. Um, we wanted to, to share, we've got um, a link to an FAQ that Sahan Journal published on the public safety amendment. Um, if Jamie or Michaela could put that in the chat, um, that would be great. And also stay tuned, we're gonna be publishing um, a voter guide for the Minneapolis elections. It's a project we've been working on with Sahan Journal and Pillsbury United Communities that's gonna cover um, all of the mayor's races and city council all in response to questions directly from the community. So uh, that will be publishing very, very soon. Um, and early voting in Minneapolis starts uh, this Friday, September 17th, and the general election is on November 2nd. Um, and lastly, just wanted to also share our partners at Software for Good are hosting um, Code Switch, which is the National Day of Civic ha uh, Hacking. Uh, that is on Saturday. Um, which is also kind of on topic with today's conversation about reimagining 911. Uh, so we'll put the link to register for that event uh, in the chat as well. And lastly, uh, we'll be sending out a follow up email um, in the next coming days with uh, resources and ways to connect with the people that you met. So thank you everyone for showing up this morning for participating in the conversation and go vote. Thanks everybody. <laughs>